Let's deep dive into Docker. Mm -hmm. And then if I switch, you should be able to see Visual there Studio There we go. Code. Yes, Visual Studio Code. How's that looking? Big enough? All good? It's lovely. I can read it. Okay. Perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. So ready to go? Off you go. Fan Thank you. Fantastic. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to this session, a deep dive into Docker. A little bit about myself first. My name is Andrew Prusky. I'm a SQL Server DBA, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and certified Kubernetes administrator, originally from Swansea, Wales, but I've been living in Dublin, Ireland for, uh, it's coming on to eight years now. Um, my Twitter handle and my email address are on the slide there, at DBA from the cold and DBA from the cold at gmail.com. So if you have any questions after today, please feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. My blog's there as well, dbafromthecold.com, posted multiple articles about running SQL Server and containers, some of which I'm using to base this session on, and some of which explore different topics, so you're more than welcome to check that out. And then finally, my GitHub account. All the slides and the code for the demos that we'll be doing today are on my GitHub account, and I will post a link to that repo at the end of the session. So, on to the session. The aim of this session is to not just spin up SQL Server in a container, but just to dive a little bit deeper into it. We're going to have a look at some of the constructs in Linux that create containers, and we're going to have a look at some other things as well. So let's have a look at what we're going to be covering. So we're going to cover container isolation. How is isolation achieved for a container running on a Linux host? Then we're going to have a look at some container networking. So we're going to have a look at the different options that we have when we spin up containers and attach them to different networks. Then we're going to have a look at probably one of the most important things for us SQL Server folks, persisting our data in Docker containers. And there's a few different ways we're going to do it. We're going to explore two of them because one of them I don't really like, so I'm not going to touch that. So we'll have a look at different ways of persisting our data from one container to another. Then we're going to have a look at spinning up some custom images from Docker files. And then finally, we're going to take everything we talked about today, wrap it all together, and combine it using Docker Compose. But first things first, container isolation. The definition on the slide there is from the Docker website, and it's saying containers isolate software from its environment and ensure that it works uniformly from environment to environment, no matter where you deploy them. It's kind of glossing over what isolation is. And even I do this. When someone asks me what a container is, I always say containers are an isolated environment that contains all the necessary binaries and libraries required by a piece of software so that it can run in the same manner, regardless of its environment. So containers, are isolated environments. But how is that isolation achieved? Now, containers aren't actually a thing. When we run processes in containers, they are just processes running on the host. So there are three different types, of, there are three different constructs in Linux that provide that isolation. The first one being something called control groups. Control groups control the resources of the host that a container can utilize. So we can see this in action when we spin up a container and use the memory flag or the CPU's flag. And what that does is limit the amount of CPU and memory that a container can use on the host. And what's happening in the background is that control groups are being created that are actually enforcing those limits. And we can go in and we can dive in and we'll see this in a demo of actually exploring and viewing those limits in place in those control groups. So we are, that's control groups, controlling the resources of the host. Now, we don't really care if we're just spinning up one container and running on a host and then blowing it away doing our work. This only really comes into play when you're running, say, multiple containers on a host. This is where the noisy neighbor syndrome comes in. One container taking all the resources of the host and starving all the other containers. And you can see their performance degrading. So this is why when you're running multiple containers on a host, always use the CPUs and CPU and memory flags, especially if you have multiple containers, a lot of containers running there. And we'll see this in demos coming up shortly. So that's control groups, controlling the resources of the host. The next one is namespaces. If control groups control what a container can use, namespaces control what a container can see. Now there's a whole bunch of them, but the ones I wanna focus on, the first one is something called, obviously called the Unix time-sharing system namespace. Now it sounds kind of scary, but all that really does is allow the host name that the container sees to be different than the host name of the host. So if you run host name within a container, you'll generally see something different from the host, usually a short and abbreviated version of the container ID. That's because it is in a Unix times sharing system namespace. 
The next one are the processes that a container can see. We don't want the container to be able to see all the processes on the host. We only want it to be able to see its own processes. And that is because it's in something called a process ID namespace, PID namespace. So host Unix time sharing system namespace, changing the host name, process ID namespace, controlling the process that a container can see. And then the final one at the bottom, they're mapping users in the container to users on the host. This is something called the user namespace. Now it's not implemented in Docker by default. So what this means is users running in a container will be mapped directly to users running on the host. Now this can cause issues because that means a process running as root in the container will be running as root on the host and potentially gain access to resources on the host that it potentially shouldn't have. And this is one of the reasons why Microsoft, I think starting maybe one of the latest versions of 2017, but definitely the first versions of 2019, switched from running SQL Server in root as a container to running as the MS SQL user. And that caused some issues, which we'll see in, again, the demos coming up, but that was one of the reasons for it. So we have control groups, controlling what a container can use, namespaces, controlling what a container can see. And then we have the file system. Containers cannot see the entire host file system. We don't want them to either. They only see a little subset of that file system. And that's because upon startup, the root of the container is changed to that little subset. So as the container comes up, its root is changed and it can only see from the top of that root down. So by using control groups, namespaces, and changing the root of the container, we achieve container isolation. So let's go ahead and let's jump into a demo and let's have a look at that in action. So here I am, I'm up on my Linux host. Let's just make sure it hasn't frozen up on me. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, so let's run a container and we're gonna limit the memory available to it. So very quickly, we're gonna say docker container run dash D. We're gonna demonize it, run it in the background. We're gonna publish some ports. So port 15789 on the host is gonna be mapped to port 1433 in the container. So that just means anything hitting 15789 on the host will be mapped to 1433 within the container. We always do this when we spin up SQL in the container. And by the way, that 15789 number, I'm just plucking that out of thin air. I just need a port on the host that's not in use. Then I'm gonna use my memory flag. I'm gonna limit the memory that is available to this container to two gig. Then I'm gonna accept the end user license agreement. Have to do this every time we run a uh, SQL in a container. Set an SA password, given the container a name, and then I'm gonna pick an image that I wanna run my container from. In this case, it's gonna be the 2019 CU5 Ubuntu 18.04 image. So let's run that. I get a warning there about my kernel not supporting swap, but let's not worry about that for now. And let's make sure that container's running. There we go, looks good. Status of up of seven seconds. Now, I don't really want that command information in there and all that port stuff. So what I can do is I can filter it using the format flag. Now, okay, in practice, this isn't really useful, but for presenting, it's really good. So I can do that. And there we go, we get a little tidier output. So there we go, nice and simple. I've got my container, I've got the image, I've got the status, I've got the ports that are mapped. Brilliant stuff. Okay. So we've got our container, it's up and running. Let's grab that container ID. And let's have a look at those control groups that are created. And there's gonna be a bunch of them, but the ones I'm interested in are the memory and the CPU. So let's grab those. And then have a look at the memory limit. So we've got a memory dot limit in bytes. And because it's in bytes, let's divide it a couple of times to get the megabytes and boom, that is the control group created when this container spun up and there is the memory limit in place. So let's have a look at the CPU one as well. We can see that it's set to minus one, didn't set a limit when I spun up this container. So it is unlimited. So that's what that minus one flag is. But we can update our container and set that limit whilst 
on the fly. And I'm saying thank you to Anthony Nocentino there, because I didn't know you could do this on the fly. I thought you had to shut it down, spin it back up. But nope, Docker update, container name, bump, we can enforce that limit. There we go. And now let's have a look at it. And bump. OK, it's 200,000, but yes, that is two CPUs. So we've enforced a CPU limit for a container on the fly to two CPUs. And we can see that in action by querying the control groups on the host. All righty, let's have a look at the namespaces now. So if I do sudo lsns and have a look at msql, we've got a whole bunch of namespaces created. So we have our process ID namespace, we have our UTS, we have a mount namespace. We typically don't want containers to have the same file system mounts as the host, so there's a mount namespace. We have a network namespace. Containers get their own view of network interfaces. And we have an inter-process communications namespace. Process on Linux can share memory. And we typically don't want uh, containers to access each other's shared memory, so that's why we have an IPC namespace there as well. But let's investigate a couple of these namespaces. Typically, the mount, uh, UTS namespace and the PID namespace is what we're going to look at. So let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at the host name of the host I'm running on. And I've very originally called it Docker. But if we use Docker exec, which means we can execute a command against a container, let's have a look at the host name there. So we're saying Docker exec, our container name, and then the command we want to run. We can see that it's different. We've got it's pretty much the container ID, uh, maybe a little bit of a shortened version of it. But it can do that because it is in the Unix time system sharing namespace. Well, I might go out UTS namespace. Let's just stick with that. And again, if I have a look at the processes running within that container, it can only see its own processes. And it's only got SQL running and then myself here. And we have a look, it's got a PID of one and a PID of 11. But processes in a container are just processes running on the host. So we can see them here. If I just do PS org on my host, we can see them running. And they've got different I IDs because the container is in a process ID namespace. And you might as well notice the user user namespace is not implemented here. So that MSQL user is mapped to a user on the host, but it doesn't exist on the host. And that's why we get an ID there instead of the actual name of the user. So let's see if we can just play around with this a little bit. If we grab the PID from, if we grab the PID of the MSQL process on the host, there it is, 21240. I can actually use NSENter and specify the namespaces I want to jump into. And I can jump into the namespaces created for that container. Now I can check the host name, ID of the container, and I can have a look at the processes running as well. So we can do all sorts of funny little things in the background to see what's actually happening when we spin a container up and have a look at those Linux concept constructs that are created to achieve container isolation. OK, let's jump out of there. Blah. All right, so let's run another container. And this time I'm going to run it from a custom SQL image that I have. And all this is doing is running SQL as root on the host uh, in the container, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. And these custom images are all available in the uh, GitHub repo as well. They're publicly available. You can pull them down, play around with them, do what you want with them. So let's have a look at this host again. There we go. We got our original container. And we've got our second one here. And we can see this time, because SQL is running as root in the container, and there's no user namespace involved, it is mapped directly to the root user on the host, which might give it a little bit more access than we want it to, could potentially be an issue. And that's why it's always advisable to run processes in containers as something other than root. OK, let's see if we can create this a database in one of those containers. We're going to go back to the first container and just say create database test database. Oh, by the way, this is the MS SQL CLI. It's uh, like a beefed up version of SQL command. I absolutely love it. I'd highly recommend you check it out. You get some cool things like IntelliSense and stuff like that. OK, so we've created our database. Whoop. Let's have a look at where those database files live. So Docker exec against my container, listing everything under this. And this is the default location for the system databases and any user databases unless we switch it upon SQL startup using an environment variable. And there we go, we can see there's our test database. So let's have a look at that on the host. Aha, doesn't exist. 
This is because the container's root has been changed upon startup. So it, the container thinks, hey, it lives there on the host. It doesn't, it lives in a little subset of the actual host. So we can find that out as well. If we just dive in and do Docker inspect SQL container and have a look at this location, we can grab that and have a look at the root directory of the container on the host. That's where it is. There's var there. We can jump up and boom, that is the location of the files on the host. SQL, uh, the container thinks it's there, but it's actually under this location because the container's root was switched, sorry, changed upon startup. So that's control groups, namespaces, and changing the root of the container upon startup. And we can have a dive in and have a look at all of this stuff in the background whilst our container's running. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Excellent stuff. Okay, I'm gonna caveat this with, if this actually works, it will be a minor miracle. But if we know all the constructs around a container, can we build one from scratch? Now, the first thing we need to do, and yes, I do realize that I'm spinning up a container. I would say we're just about to build one from scratch. But what we need to do is we need to extract all of the files out of this container so we can use it for our container built from scratch. So there it is. We can make sure it's up and running. Looks good. We can have a look to make sure SQL's running in it by using Docker logs. And there we go. That looks pretty good to me. Let's do it one more time. Yes, OK, all good. All right, so we've got a container up and running. SQL's running with it. So we know it all works like that. We're going to stop that container. I'm just going to grab some water while it, I do that. So we stop that container now. And we can export that container to a .tar file. Now, in the interest of time, I've already done this. So we have it on our host is in my home directory under SQL Server. And there we go. That is the root of our container. And that's going to be the root of our container built from scratch. So what I'm going to do is actually add a little file in there called hidebe from the cold. There we go. Now, if we start up that container again and list its root, we can see that it pretty much matches. But this time, I've added a file called hidebe from the cold. And our container doesn't have that one. So we've extracted out that container's file system, dropped it into a custom location on our host, added a little file, double check that it all looks good, and now we can blow that container away. All righty, so now I'm gonna to navigate to some code that I have on my host. And I'm not gonna cat mingo it there, I'm gonna have a look at it. Where is it? Container from scratch, here. Now, I'm not a GoPro, program in any way, shape or form. I'm kind of a hack that just mucks around with stuff and tries to get things to work. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. The things I do wanna point out though, there's a couple of things. If we come down here, this is where we are creating our namespaces. So we're gonna create UTS and PID. If we come down a little bit further, we're gonna set the host name to a container and we're gonna change the route to our home DBA from the cold SQL server. So this is gonna change the root of our new container to that directory we just extracted from our other running container built by Docker and put it on the host under SQL server. Then if we come a little bit further down, we're gonna create some control groups. So here we are going to create a control group for memory, limit it to two gig. And here we're gonna create a control group for CPU and limit it to two CPUs. And then we've just got some little bit more code there. So, okay, this is where it all goes a little bit pear shaped because I'm gonna use too much. There we go, okay. So control B, excellent stuff. All right, now that main.go code, that go code to spin up a container from scratch is pretty much exactly Liz Rice's code that she used in her session called, well, uh, it's containers from scratch. Uh, I've just made some minor tweaks for SQL Server, but if you want to go and see an in-depth explanation of exactly what it's doing, I highly recommend you go and check it out. The link is here. And I've got a link to it at the end of the session as well. So let's run that. And what we're doing is we're going to go into our container. Looks good. Let's have a look at it. Hey, we're in our container. We've changed our route to where we extracted. We've got our file system there. Check the host name container. 
And uh, we needed to add a, to, I couldn't get this to work for SQL Server for love nor money. It kept erroring out on me. I was talking to a friend of mine, Mark Wilkinson, and, I, and he realized that I needed to create a special type of file called urandom. Now I've already done this. If we have a look in LS Dev. Oh yes, if I could type, it'd be good. There it is. So thank you very much, Mark. Got me past the hurdle of actually getting this to work. So let's spin this up. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say run SQL Server. And all this does is run it in the background. So if we go there, we can see. Let's have a look to see if we've got the processes on our container. We've only got the one so far. We should get two in a minute. Come on. One more time. OK, so we have SQL Server running. There should be another child process coming up. But let's have a look at the host. Uh, there we go. We have our two processes. So if I come back down here, haha, and do that. Boom. We have our two SQL Server processes running in our container built from scratch. And there we go. We can see our running as root. Uh, but we can see it's in a process ID namespace as well because the PIDs are different. So that's kind of cool. We can also, let's have a look at the host as well. Where are we? I'm not very good at using this. <laughs> there we go. Right. Let's have a look at the memory stuff. And let's have a look at CPU stuff. And we can see here we have a file called SQL directory called SQL Server, SQL Server. So we should be able to grab that. And again, there we go. Right at the bottom here, we have our limit in place from the C group that we created from that main.go file. And then if we have a look here as well, we should be able to see the CPU limit as well. So by knowing the constructs, the C groups, the namespaces, the change in the root, we can actually build a container from scratch in Go. Now, OK, there are a few things missing, things like port mapping and stuff like that. But I think we can see that we're just playing around and seeing if we know the um, concepts, we can replicate what we're seeing in Docker. And it, I like to see it because it explains what Docker is doing in the background. OK, it's not going to be as stable as Docker. Don't put anything into a container like this with like you don't want to lose because you probably will. But really like that just by knowing what's happening in the background, we can go and spin this stuff up for ourselves. Okay, so let's come out of there. Uh, let's come out of here. And let's jump back into the slides. So that is container isolation. Now let's have a look container networking. When we install Docker on a host and we run Docker Network LS, we will see three network options there by default. Bridge, which is the default, host, and none. Now, bridge is the one we all use. If we don't specify any networking options, we will connect our containers to this network. And I'll talk a little bit more about that network in a minute. Host pretty much does exactly what it says on the tin. It removes the isolation. Isolation between the containers networking stack and the host networking stack uh, can be useful in certain switch. I've never particularly used it. And then none. Again, exactly what it says on the tin removes all, it basically disables the containers networking stack. There's no outside. You, do you want to do your work? You exec into your container. You do your work. When you're finished, you blow your container away. Useful if you want a really highly isolated environment with no outside uh, talking into it. Jump in, do your work, blow it away. But let's talk about that default bridge network. As I said, this is the default network. If you run IP A on a container host, you will see it represented as Docker zero. And in terms of Docker, a bridge network is simply a software bridge that allows all containers connected to that same bridge network to be communicate with each other whilst isolating them from all other networks. And containers on the default bridge network can communicate by each other, but only by their own individual IP address. So you need to work out their IP address, and then you can get your containers talking to each other. 
And then the final point there supports port mapping. We've all seen this. We did this in the previous demo. We used a dash dash p, a dash p or dash dash publish flag, and we can map ports on the host to ports within the container. We can do things like, like localhost 15789, and that maps us through into our container we connect to SQL. So that's a bridge network. It's kind of good, but containers communicating by our IP address isn't great. What we want to do is have something like DNS resolution for container name to IP address. And we can do that by creating what's known as a user-defined network. And Docker allows us to do this and supports multiple drivers for us to do this. So we have things like the ones we've already seen, bridge, host, none, overlay, which is allow multiple Docker daemons to talk to each other. It's used in Docker Swarm. And then Mac VLAN as well, which actually allows you to assign a Mac address to your container so it appears as a physical device on your network. The one I want to talk about is a user-defined bridge network. Because a user-defined bridge network allows for containers to utilize Docker's internal DNS server. And that means we get DNS resolution of container names to IP addresses. So we don't need to go and work out the IP addresses of the containers. They can communicate with each other on the same user-defined bridge network by their name. Now, this is really handy. A while ago, I was trying to get, um, I can't remember why <laughs> for life of me, but I was trying to get replication working between two containers. And I used created a user-defined bridge network to allow them to talk to each other by container name. And then I could get it up and running because using the IP address was a real pain. So we have user-defined bridge networks that have some advantages over the default bridge network. Chief one being DNS resolution. The second one being the containers can be connected to more than one network and we can disconnect and connect to user-defined networks on the fly. With the default network, we have to shut the container down and then spin it back up. So our user-defined networks have advantages over that default bridge network. And let's go have a look at that in another demo. Okay, so there's my previous one. Let's jump into container networking. And here we go. Let's have, let's go over that. Okay, so we have our three default networks, bridge, host, and none. We can actually have a look at that. We can say Docker network inspect bridge. And we get, we can get some, we got our subnet, we get our gateway, no containers running on it at the moment. So let's spin two containers up on the default bridge network. Notice I'm not mapping any ports here either, just spinning them up. And I'm running these from a custom image that I've built. It just has some tools installed, um, chief on being ping. So spin those two up. Let's have a look at them. Ports are up. Yep, looks good. Okay, so let's now have a look at that bridge network again. Okay, this time we can see that we have our two containers and they have IP addresses on that network. So let's grab those IP addresses, IP1 and IP2. And then let's use Docker exec to ping one of the containers from the other using its container name. It'll error immediately, service and name not known, no DNS resolution of container name to IP address is supported on the default bridge network but we can use IP address, no problem. And that'll ping, absolutely no worries. And then if I wanna to connect to SQL, no port mapping, remember I can use that IP address and just run something simple like select ATAT version. And there we go, excellent. So I can grab the IP address of the container, drop it into my MS SQL CLI command, and I can connect to SQL, no bother. Okay, let's get rid of those. And now what we can do to try and get around this um, resolution, uh, DNS resolution issue, if it really is an issue, is we can actually add a host name entry for the other container when we spin up our container so that we could use host name, uh, we could use container names when we ping them. Okay, we need to know the IP address first, but it's a little option for us if we don't want to use a user-defined network. Let's have a look. And now, there we go. I can use container name to ping the other one on the default bridge network because I've added an entry into the hostname file for that container for the other container. Okay, this time let's do what we usually do when we spin up a container and we're gonna spin two containers up on the default bridge network 
and we're going to map some ports. So this time publishing 15789 to port 1433 within the container. So anything hit in the host on 15789 gets mapped to 1433 within the container, and I can connect to SQL Server. As before, I'm just plucking these containers, uh, sorry, IP uh, port numbers out of thin air. So let's do that again. There we go. And then we can use Docker port and we can actually bring that up. Docker port, Docker port, and we can actually use that to view the end, the port mappings instead of running Docker container LS and all this. We can just dive in and grab that if we want to. And then as we always do, using localhost and the port number, and then to connect into SQL. There we go, nice and simple. So that's the default bridge network. We can use IP addresses, we can map ports, we can add host name, uh, we can add host entry, host file entries for other containers, things like that, if we want to get them if we want to get them talking to each other. So now let's have a look at creating a custom bridge network. So nice and simple, we're just going to say Docker network create, and we need to give our bridge network a name called SQL Server. Not specifying a driver here, so the default we'll get is a bridge network. You can see it here. Default bridge. So we have our custom network up and running. So now I can use the network flag and create two more containers on that custom network. There we go, up and running. And now without doing anything, I can ping the containers by name because custom bridge networks support DNS resolution from container name to IP address. And we can have a look at it. If we just jump in and have a look at the Etsy resolve.conf file, we get a name server and that is the IP address of the Docker internal DNS server. So by using that custom bridge network, we don't have to muck around. We can instantly get two containers talking to each other via their container name. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a cleanup. And let's jump back into the slides. So that is container networking. So we've covered so far, we've done isolation and we've poked around at some Linux internals. We've had a look at networking and building us a custom network. Now let's have a look at probably the most important subject for us SQL Server folks is persisting our data. How do we persist our data from one container to another? And we get three different options really for doing this. We have bind mounts, which is mapping volumes from the host. Now, I don't like this. I don't like this at all because you're putting an external dependency for the container on the host. If the location doesn't exist on a host, you're gonna get issues and you can run into permissions issues and things like that. What this is useful for is say you wanna put a really big database into a container, you don't want to copy it into a container, which I suggest you don't, then mounting from the host can be an option for you. But I don't want to focus on bind mounts. I want to focus on data volume containers and named volumes. Data volume containers are a little bit of a weird concept. You create a container with a load of volumes on it. You then take the volumes from that data volume container and map them into your regular container. And you can uh, play around with them, make data, make databases, things like that, and then blow your other container away and your data volume container is retained with all your volumes. And this can be handy when you have a lot of volumes that you want to map, and we'll see why in the demo coming up shortly. But all the data volume container is doing in the background is creating named volumes. And this is the one I want to focus on. Named volumes are volumes created within Docker that have a life cycle that are separate from any container. So you can spin up a container, mount your volumes, do your work, blow your container away, but you still have your data on your volume, which means you can then spin up another container, remount the volumes and continue on from where you left off. And that's the key thing with containers that separates the compute from the data. Because we don't really care about the compute, do we? We care about the data. So the compute is now a throwaway object. We can do whatever we want with it. We can spin it up, work with it, blow it away, spin it up, work with it, blow away, as long as we retain our data. And name volumes will allow us to do that. So no more yakking. Let's go and have a look at this in a demo. So here we go. 
first things first, let's create a name volume. So I'm just saying Docker, create me a volume called SQL Server. And then I can view that it's there with Docker volume LS. Nicely done. OK, and now I can spin up a container with that volume mapped. And there it is, dash dash volume SQL Server. And I'm going to map it to this custom location within the container called var opt SQL Server. Now, want to note, I don't need to go and manually create this. If I spin up a container and this volume doesn't exist, Docker will automatically create it for us. But I'm just stepping. I like to do it step by step in my demos. But yep, absolutely no need to manually create this. I could have just spun this up. So let's bring that up. OK. And let's make sure that container is running. Looking good. OK, let's go and create a database. So using the MS SQL CLI, I'm going to create a database, both files on that custom location I just mounted my name volume under. So we'll let that go. Let's see what happens. Mm. OK, we can go on error. Little A little bit misleading. I can't find the file specified. What's happened is if we have a look at this, the owner of that directory is actually the root user. SQL runs as the MS SQL user. So it doesn't have access to that location that I've just created. So we need to go and give it access. So I'm going to use Docker exec, and I'm going to use dash u as zero. So I'm going to go into the container's root and change the owner of this location to the MS SQL user. There we go. Let's have a look at it again. We get the MS SQL user here now. OK. So. Second time's a charm. Let's try creating that database again. Fingers crossed. And there we go. So now we've granted access for SQL. It can see that location, and we can create our database on it. So let's have a look at what we have. We can confirm the database is there. Good stuff. We have our test database there. And now let's just blow that container away. Not being nice about it, just saying dash it. Our Docker container remove. And all this does is pick out any container ID running and then forcibly remove because the container was running. OK. To show I'm not cheating, container is definitely gone. But we still have our name volume because its life cycle is separate from the container. So we still have our data. We've just blown that compute away. Let's spin up another container and let's remap that volume. There we go. OK. Make sure that container is running. Five seconds, all good. Now I don't need to go and reset, uh, change the permissions again. The owner of that folder, it will retain itself from one container to another. I can double check that. There we go. We can see the owner is MS SQL. And now I can recreate that database using the for attached syntax. So I can go there, hit that, and we should be all good to go. Excellent stuff. OK, let's have a look at it. Make sure database is actually there in the container. And there we go. We have our database back. So we've managed by using a name volume to persist our database from one container to another. I'm not sure about you, but I don't particularly like that. I, every time I spin up a container, I don't want to be running a create database for attached statement to get that database back. It'd be better if the databases were automatically there every time we just spun up a container. So let's have a look at doing just that. So let's this time create a couple more name volumes. I'm going to call MS SQL system and MS SQL user. There we go. Make sure our volumes are there. Yep, excellent. And now this time, let's spin up a container with the volumes mapped. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to map the MS SQL system name volume to var opt MS SQL. Because what I want to do is I want to retain the data folder, which is the location of the system databases, specifically the master database. Because by retaining the master database and creating a database within SQL, the master database, if we persist that from one container to another, will retain the information, oh, there's a user database. So if we retain the master database and the user database location, 
when we spin up another data container mounting these two volumes again, we should be able to automatically get our databases back into SQL. And we, let's have a look and see that in action. So there's the MS SQL one on the var op SQL server location that we created in the previous one. And, this, and here I'm going to use a couple of environment variables to specify the default data and log directories to our user database location here. So let's spin that up. Looks good. Let's make sure it's running. Up to four seconds. OK. Still have to change the owner to MS SQL. And now we can create our database. I don't need to specify the locations. I can just say create database and the database name because I've set the default data and log directories using those environment variables in the container run statement here. So now I should just be able to create the database. There we go. Confirm that it's there. And let's have a look at those file locations as well, just to make sure we've created our user database on, aha, yes, we have. They are on the location that we've backed by our name volume for the user databases. So, oh, and we can have a look at the database files as well. There we go. And yep, MS SQL user is the owner of those files, so we shouldn't have any more problems. Let's get rid of that container. Exactly the same as before, we're just gonna blow it away. Cool, container's gone, but we have our volumes. So spin up another container, again, mapping the MS SQL to var opt MS SQL, where the data folder is, which contains the system databases, specifically the master database. Also mapping our user database location, accepting the end user license agreement, setting the SA password, going to set the default data and log directories to our var opt SQL server location, giving our container a name and then the image. Okay. Let's confirm that's running. Upstairs of six seconds, you might want to give it a little bit longer, but let's give it a whirl. Take about 10 seconds usually. Boom, there we go. So by persisting the master database location and a user database location, we have our database there back automatically. We didn't have to go in and use that create database for attach statement. We just spun a container that made sure we mapped the right locations and there is our database. So we don't have to do anything else, nice and simple. Okay, there's a bit of a cleanup, get rid of all that. And now let's have a quick look at data volume containers. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say docker container create, not run, just create myself a container I'm going to give it a name of data store, create a load of volumes, and then I'm running this from a custom Ubuntu image. Now, the reason I'm doing this, we can have a quick look at it. Uh, do, 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 custom image, custom Ubuntu, is because I have to change the owner of the location. Uh, I have to change the owner of all of these locations. Otherwise, when I try and create databases and stuff, I'll get that, permit, that, that error that we saw earlier. Don't worry about that for now because there's a fix that we can do for this for SQL Server containers. But for now, it's just all I'm doing is using that custom image to give myself access to these locations so I can create a database on it. Let's create that. Oh, yeah, I've got the Docker file there. There we go. Don't worry. Exactly the same as we just saw. And let's verify that container. Excellent. Okay. So we have our container data store with a status of created. It's not running, it's just created. Not gonna do anything else with it, we're just gonna leave it there. Because in the background, what it's done for us is create us a load of name volumes. So now when I create a SQL container, I don't have to map individual volumes, I can just use the dash dash volumes from flag and say volume from my data store and we can map them in. So this is where it becomes really handy if you're mapping a lot of volumes, you don't have to type them out each time. There we go. Let's confirm that container is running. Stays about five seconds. You might want to give it a little bit longer, give it about 10 seconds maybe. Yeah, okay, there we go. And let's create a database. Excellent. 
Excellent. Okay, we have our database. Let's confirm it's there. So this is exactly as before. We spun a container up with the name volumes now. The only difference being those volumes have come from our data volume container. And we can have a look at our database files. There we go. They're on our data and our log locations. Let's get rid of that. So same as the previous demo, we're blowing away the container. Container's gone, but we still have our data store and we still have our law, our name volumes. So if I spin up another container, again, using the volumes from data store flag, if I give it a few seconds, give it six more seconds, we should now have our database back. Might have been a bit too quick. Oh, there we go. Excellent. There is our user database. So that is how we can persist a database from one container to another using name volumes, or if we want to, data volume containers. Now, I will say that name volumes is the way forward with this. Data volume containers are a little quirky, to be fair. But if you want to map a load of volumes from one container to another, and you want to type it all out, you can use a data volume container and just use the dash dash volumes dash from flag. OK. Bit of a cleanup. And let's go back into the slides. OK, so one thing we saw there for the data volume container, and we saw it when we were using name volumes as well, was that I had to grant permissions to any location that I was mounting in the container, because by default, it was coming up as root. Now, I don't really want to do that each time. I want to actually have those permissions set in my container so I don't have to do anything. I just can spin my container up, and I can go and create databases without having to worry about that. So what I can do is build my own custom image. And I can do this by using what's known as a Docker file. Now, a Docker file is a file on a, Linux, on a Docker host that just contains a bunch of commands that when we execute a Docker build, Docker will step through each one of those commands in our file on the host called docker file and the first command in it is from ms mcr microsoft.com ms sql server 2019 c5 1218.4 so what we're doing here is basing our new custom image of the 2019 CU5 Ubuntu image that Microsoft have given us up in the MCR, the Microsoft Container Registry. First thing I'm doing after that then is switching to the user root so I can go and create a whole bunch of directories within my container. So I'm going to create var ops SQL server and underneath that SQL data, SQL log and SQL backups. But then I can change the owner of those folders to the MS SQL user. Switch back to the MS SQL user and then start up SQL Server so that when my container comes up, it has all these directories ready to go, but its owner is the MS SQL user. I don't have to go and manually go in and start fiddling around like we did in the previous demo. So let's go ahead and let's have a look at that. Let's jump in straight back into the demos and have a look at building ourselves a custom image. So we're on back on the host. Let's navigate to somewhere on my host that has a Docker file. And all that's in there is a file called Docker file. And if we have a look at it, it is exactly the same thing we just saw in the slide. So building from the Microsoft image, switching to the user root, making a load of directories, changing the owner, switching back to MS SQL, and then spinning up SQL Server. So let's go ahead and let's build ourselves a custom image. And all we do is we say docker build dash t, tag this image with a name, we're going to call it custom image one, and then dot. And all dot says is look in my current location for a file called docker file. So we execute that, and we can see docker stepping through each one of those commands, building us our custom image. We are nearly at the end, there we go. Boom, okay. Confirm that image is there. 
yep, custom image one, 1.51 1 gig. It's exactly the same size as the normal SQL Server image because we haven't actually done anything. All we've done is create some empty folders. So now I can create some name volumes. Let's go ahead and create a whole bunch of them. There's my name volumes. And let's run an image from that. Let's run a container from that custom image Eva, map in those volumes, set in some default directory locations. And let's go. Good stuff. OK. Let's have a look, make sure that container is running. A few more seconds. If you have a look at the permissions on those folders, there we go. We don't have to go in and change them. They already set. The owner is the MS SQL user. So now. I can just go ahead and create a database. Great, because we set the custom image, because we set the permissions in our custom image, I don't need to manually change them. I can just go ahead and create my database. We can confirm that it's there. And same as we've been doing before, we can confirm the locations of the files, and they'll be on those locations map backed by our name volumes. So if I come back down, don't lose my place. There we go. Bar ops equal service equal data, SQL log. Excellent stuff. So by using a custom image, we can set permissions on directories that and spin up a container so we don't have to go in and manually change them later. Right. Let's get rid of that container. Okay. Container gone. Oh yeah, let's spin up another one like we did in the previous demo. Bring it back up. Being a little bit too quick here. Let's go and wait a few seconds. And we should have our database back as well. There we go. There's our test database. So we've used a custom image with custom locations backed by name volumes. So we don't have to change permissions when we spin the container up. We can just create a database and then blow that container away, retain our name volumes, spin up another one, and we have our database there back automatically. So we've separated the data from the compute. We don't care about the compute anymore. We can just blow that away. We've got our data and the compute can come in whenever we want just to access the data and we can do our work. Okay, so let's get rid of all this. And let's go a little nuts. Let's have a look at building another SQL image. But this time we're gonna build it from scratch. So I've got a whole bunch of files in here. We have a Docker file, we have some database files, and we have an attached db.sh script. Let's have a look at that Docker file first. And I won't do it in the window here. I'll bring it out. So if I do that, there we go. Boom. Okay, if I get rid of this. So what we're doing here is we're going to start off with the from as before, but we're saying from the Ubuntu.18.4 image. So we're starting off from a Ubuntu image. We're then adding a label saying maintain the guy who looks after this, the crazy person who decided to build this image is called dba from the cold at gmail.com. We're going to create the MS SQL user. And then we're going to install SQL Server. Now, these commands here are literally just from the Microsoft docs of how to install SQL Server on Linux. All I did was pick them off the website and drop them into a Docker file. So what I'm what I'm doing is just installing some dependencies and a GPG key and the repository, installing SQL Server. And then uh, here we go. Why not install some SQL Server tools as well so we can use SQL command within our container? So again, exactly the same as the directions on the website, add in a repository, run an app get update, installing the tools. Then we're going to do some stuff like we saw in the previous Docker file. We're going to create some directories. We're going to copy some database files into the directories, including this attach db.sh script, set the permissions on those directories, make that attach db.sh script executable, set some environment variables. So we're going to accept the end user license agreement, set the addition of SQL to developer, enable the agent, and then set the default data, log, and backup directories to our custom locations. Finally, switch it to the MS SQL user, and then we'll run in a command. And what we're doing here is we are executing our attach DB script and then starting SQL Server. 
Now that seems to be the wrong way around. Wouldn't we start SQL Server and then run in a script to attach the databases? Let's have a look at that attached DB script. So the first, oh, hello. The first thing that attached DB script does is sleep for 20 seconds. It doesn't do anything. It just starts and waits for 20 seconds. And then it creates our database from our files that we've copied into our container. Now, the reason we're doing this is that containers always need an active running process. If we had this the other way around, we started SQL Server and then run our attached DB script, the attached DB script would become the main running process in the container. When that attached DB script completes, the container would go, my main process is finished, and the container would shut down. Trust me, it took me a while to work this one out. But by doing it this way around, the attached DB script starts up, SQL starts up, becomes the main active process within the container. And then after 20 seconds, once SQL is spun up, the attached DB sleep statement is complete, and it creates our database for us. So let's go ahead and let's build our custom image. So here we go, docker build-t, custom image two. I'm really original when it comes to naming things. And then dot, boom. OK, I'm cheating slightly. This usually takes about 10 minutes because it's pulling stuff down and installing SQL. So I've already built this image. And we can see that because it says using cache here. But we can see it stepping through each step, each command in the Docker file and building us our custom image to dot latest image. So let's have a look. Have we got our images? There it is, custom image two. Built it about four hours ago. I was testing before I did my session. Oh, what am I doing? There we go. And we can have a look at that image. We do Docker inspect, and we can have a look. We've got a whole bunch of layers here. We can see where we've got our maintainer. We can also see our environment variables. Also, a good reason not to put your SA password as an environment variable in your image, because nefarious people like me will come in and run Docker inspect and be able to gain access to it. And then we can see that yeah, we've got a whole bunch. And we can see our command here as well. There we go. OK. One cool thing we can do is use Docker history as well. And if I use format and then no truncation, I can do this. And we can actually have a look at the build. Now, this all here is coming from the Ubuntu image. But from here up is the steps in our Docker file. So we can see bin bash, label maintainer, creating the user and then installing SQL and the SQL tools, creating our directories, copying a file in, and then changing the owner, making our script executable, our environment variables, switching to the MS SQL user, and then the final command, executing our attached DB script, and then spinning up SQL Server. OK. So let's run a container from that custom image. Now I will, if any demo is not going to work, it's going to be this one. So let's have a go. So Docker container run dash D publishes the ports, setting our SA password, giving the container a name from our custom image. Now remember we have to wait about 20 seconds. That what's happened is that container spun up, the attached DB script has come up, it's going to wait for 20 seconds, SQL's coming up, and then after 20 seconds, the attached DB script is going to create our database for us. So let's have a look how long that container been up for. About 18 seconds. So I reckon we can have a look and see if our database is there. Oh, no, I'm being a bit too quick. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, let's have it. Fingers crossed if we wait a little bit longer. <laughs> OK, something's gone wrong. Every now and again, sometimes that attach the create database statement doesn't kick in. It doesn't create my database. And no matter how many times I test it, it always seems to fall apart when I demo it. But let's have a quick look. No, let's say, so if we do Docker logs, what was the name of that container? SQL container. I won't spend too much time troubleshooting this. Uh, Docker logs, SQL container three. If we've got a, yeah, there we go. It seems to have. Mm. Didn't pray enough to the demo gods, unfortunately. One more time. 
just in case. No. Okay, what we could do is we could go docker exec dash it and we can go SQL container three. Oh, this is why I don't type demos. I mean, go cd var opt SQL server. And we could run our script. It's going to wait 20 seconds again, and then it should run our create database statement. Now, okay, because it's a little bit flaky like this, this isn't something I'd recommend you to do like for out in the wild. But what I'm showing you here is that you can run scripts within your Docker file to do things like you know maybe create an empty database or something like that. Pretty much anything you'd like. There we go. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with the script itself. There's just something wrong upon container startup. So if I come out now, and this time. Do a select start from database. Our database should be there. Yay. OK. Let's clean up and let's jump into the final section of the slides. OK, so we've talked a whole bunch about containers here. We've talked about isolation, networking, persisting data, building custom images. And what I want to do now is wrap all of that together and use it in something called Docker Compose. Now, let's have a look at a Docker container run statement. Here's 15 lines of code. So we're saying Docker container run dash D, demonize the container, run it in the background, publish some ports, map some ports 15789 five, to 1433 three within the container. Set in a whole bunch of environment variables. Yes, I know I've got the uh, SA, it should be MS SQL SA password, but both do work. Uh, accepting the end user license agreement, enabling the agent, setting our default data log and backup directories to custom locations. We've got a custom network, SQL Server. We're mounting some volumes, SQL System, SQL Data, SQL Log, SQL Backup, giving our container a name, and then specifying the image that we're going to build our container from. Now, do I really want to be typing out that every single time I want to run a container? Not really. Now, OK, yes, copy paste. You could put it in a, uh, a script and just execute that script. But there's got to be a better way. Thankfully, there is. It is called Docker Compose. Now, the definition there is from the Docker website. And it says that Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications. Now, this threw me a little bit when I first started looking at Compose. I thought, oh, it's only for running multiple containers. And I thought that for ages until I went to um, DockerCon. Uh, I was in the speaker dinner there. But I was speaking. I didn't crash. But I went up to a load of the Docker captains, and they were talking about Compose. And I said, well, I don't really use Compose because it's, uh, I'm usually just spinning up a couple of SQL containers or just one and playing around with it. So I don't need it because it's for running multi-container applications. And one of the captains turned around and said, no, 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 I use Compose for everything. It makes things so much simpler. So I started having a look at it. And it's really, really quite great. Because instead of having that 15 lines of nightmare that you have to type out or put in a file or copy paste every single time you want to run a container on a custom network of volumes mapped and all this, you simply define everything in config files. Unfortunately, there is a YAML file involved. So there's people who don't like YAML. Sorry but it makes it so much simpler for spinning up a container. So no more mucking around. Let's jump straight back into the demos and let's have a look. I'm going to close all that. There we go. OK, so let's come back here. And let's have a look at Docker Compose. So this is the container run statement. And we're still going. We're still going. No, I don't want to be doing that every single time. Let's have a look at some Compose files. So in this directory, I have docker compose.yaml, a docker file, and a SQL server.env file. So let's go and have a look at those. Where's me compose? Here we go. So the first thing we have is a docker file. And this is exactly the same as the one we had in the previous demo. Let's get rid of that. Really simple, just from the Microsoft image, creating some directories, changing the owner, spinning up SQL. Nice and simple. Then we have an environment variable file. So this is where we can specify all of our environment variables. And yes, I know I've got the MS SQL, uh, I've got the password in there. It's not great. You can actually have multiple environment variable files. And I'd separate, you know, separate this out into another one and then include that, say, sapassword.env 
in like a git ignore file. So if you push these files up to a, a public location, public repo, that file doesn't get up. You're not putting your SA password in a config file. But we've got SA password, MS, uh, accepting the end user license agreement, enabling the agent, and then the data log and backup directory, same as we've been doing all the way through these demos. And then finally, we have our Docker compose.yaml file. So you have a version, and this is services, but this is where we're specifying our containers. So we're gonna have SQL Server 1. We're gonna ask it to build context, local, look in the same location as a file called Docker file. So this is gonna build us a custom image. We're gonna map some ports, here's our environment variable file, and then we're specifying some volumes. So let's go ahead and let's go and build ourselves a container using Docker Compose. So let's skip through this. Let's have a look. We've got no, we've got the default networks on the host, no name volumes, and these are our images. So we've got my custom images, the Ubuntu image, and then the SQL Server image here as well. Oh, sorry, I'll get rid of that. Okay. So now instead of that 15 long lines of code, I can just say Docker Compose up dash D, demonize it, run it in the background. And we can see that it's creating me a custom network for name volumes. And now it's building me my custom image from the Docker file that I specified within my compose.yaml file. There we go, we can say we got the image was built because it didn't really exist. If I want to rebuild in the future, I can use Docker compose build. So now let's have a look. We have our custom network, Compose. We have a bunch of name volumes. And we have our custom image as well. And of course, we have our container running as well. So yeah, I mean, I can do exactly the same as we've been doing through all the demos. I can go and create a database. There we go. Our database files are there. And I can check using uh, site staff, like name from sys databases. Excellent stuff. Okie dokie. And then when I'm finished, I can just say Docker Compose down. And what this is going to do is do a little bit of tidying up for me, but it will retain certain things that we want to retain, specifically things like our name volume and our image. So that's stopping our container, removing our network, and let's have a look. So our network's gone. Who cares, it's just a custom network. We can build another one. Our container's gone, but we have our volumes and we have our custom image. So we can use Docker Compose up again and we can reuse our image. We can use our, our volumes and our database will be there ready to go. Okay. So let's do a little bit of a cleanup here and then jump back into the slides. Okay, that's pretty much it for me. I have some resources for you here. I have a link to the repo there, uh, my Docker Deep Dive repo on GitHub, where all the slides and all the code and all the container images are available. If you want to take that down and play around with it, you are more than welcome. The second link there is a link to my blog. I've got a summary of every single post I've ever written about SQL Server and Docker containers. Um, you can check that out. And then last year as well, I actually went on GitHub and I wrote something called the SQL Server and Containers Guide, which is just like a GitHub wiki, which will take you from spinning up your first container to building things like custom images, building SQL Server from scratch using um, installing on Linux, and then using Docker Compose as well. So it really is like a step-by-step -step through thing of how you can get up and running and playing around with all the different options for SQL Server in containers. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? We do indeed. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was excellent. So I'll kick off with the first question, which is from Madhu. So what are the disadvantages of SQL Server Docker on Windows compared to Linux? Um, Windows, well, Linux containers really are more, um, I'm going to say, mature technology. Uh, the startup times, for instance, for SQL Server on Windows, I remember being, it can be a couple of minutes, whereas you saw when I was doing that on Linux, they come up pretty much instantly. Also, the SQL Server images on Windows aren't getting a lot of love from Microsoft at the moment. Um, I can't, I don't think there is a 2019 Windows image available, uh, but there definitely is on Linux and we've been playing around with that. So definitely if you have a choice between using Windows containers and Linux containers, definitely go for the Linux containers. 
Great, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Maddie, for the question. Um, question from JD Walker. So, can you have multiple containers running SQL Server and have them participating in availability groups? Since it's not Windows, you can't use WSFC for automatic failover. Is there a way to get that without the Windows clustering? Uh, you won't be able to get automatic failover. You can use there's an, a, a new um, AG type of external or none. So you can definitely get that working, but the failover will be with, I think, off the top of my head, we'll, you know, and double check this, but you'd have to use um, failover allow uh, data loss. But you could definitely spin two containers up and try and get them talking to each other. I have played with it a little bit, but not for a while. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, as an aside, JD also commented in the chat that he likes your yakking. So thank you, JD. <laughs> Um, next question from SA, how do data vaults handle data changes? How do, sorry? Uh, data vaults or data volumes possibly handle data changes? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, you might want to clarify, I mean, as in if I add data, if I add um, more files to the volumes and things like that, I'm not too sure. I'm not sure. If, if you're still tuned in, SA, please do. You'll Please do. I mean, if add some context. About, uh, yeah, I mean, you'd be limited by the volumes on the host. And it, you can actually use a plugin to configure where name volumes are created on the host as well. So if you have, say, like a super fast SSD on your Linux host, you want to make sure the name volumes are created there, you can use that plugin and switch it to that location. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And yeah, I'll let you know if there's uh, any no more follow up to that particular question. Uh, so moving on to a question from Brahma, when will Windows containers for SQL Server be available and can I build cluster on Docker? Uh, so we talked about the Windows containers one. Um, mm -hmm. Microsoft, they are available, they're on the Docker hub. I haven't seen them in the Microsoft container registry and Microsoft recently have announced that they're, they're getting rid of all the container images on the Docker hub. So I, I'm not too sure what the future for SQL Server and Windows containers are, I'm afraid. Um, I definitely would recommend staying with Linux containers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question from Maddie, thank you Maddie. Can we use Docker SQL Server images in a production environment? Uh, is it development and testing only? Uh, that's the big question. I would say Docker on its own is a dev and test uh, environment only, purely for the recovery. I mean, you can set things like, uh, there's, an, there's a restart option for containers. So if the server goes down, the containers will automatically restart and things like that. But you're still just running on um, one host. So that is a single point of failure. This is where you're going to get into the world of orchestrators and things like Docker Swarm or sw Swarm, Swarm or, or Kubernetes. And then that will bring you into a whole new different world of testing. But if you're gonna if you're gonna look at running a SQL Server in a container in a production environment, you have to look at an orchestrator. Okay, great. And then a related question: is this being used in production? I know of a couple of people who use them. I'm currently in the middle of doing a proof of concept for SQL Server on Kubernetes um, in production. We uh, hit a couple of snags. It's all around, uh, it's all around um, storage, actually, getting things right with storage. We're, you can have fit. Well, we tested in, we've tested in a few environments. We've tested up in EKS, AKS, and on-premises. And I'm, I've never been quite happy with how volumes migrate from host to host. So we're looking at some interesting things there. The main thing being with uh, Kubernetes, the volumes will detach from a node and then move to the node that containers on. You've got to do a few little tweaks and a uh, little uh, get your config right to make sure that failover from one node to another is quick enough. Um, if you want to, uh, I'll plug my friend here. If you want to check out SQL Server on Kubernetes, go and have a look at Anthony Nocentino's blog. I've got a load of stuff as well, but he's got a Pluralsight course on it as well. So I recommend you check his stuff out. He's got a whole load of great Kubernetes resources. Okay, yeah, and I know Anthony does have a lot of resources and he's done a few sessions recently, so there's probably a recording somewhere too. So yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Check those out. <laughs> um, so a bit more context on the previous question from SA. Thank you very much. Um, so let's say you spin up your databases on the volumes, you change data, spin down the container. Will it preserve the data changes? Yes, absolutely. Um, remember the data is separate to the, the volumes. So you spin your container up, make your changes, blow away the container, those changes are 
preserved. So when you spin up another container and access it again, you will have your data changes there. Great, thank you very much. Andrew, um, question from London DBA. What would be number one on your wish list slash enhancement request for SQL Server Docker containers? 